so okay good morning welcome uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have you here with us and uh, well the, the ideas of this workshop is kind of uh, a corollary of uh, a big conference that we organize in the middle of the year um, the, well we, we we strongly believe in this kind of uh, event to, to do research so we, we have a lot of time to discuss as you see in the and do the and the the week. Um, so the, the the history is more or less like that, like that. We had uh, a PG defense and in the middle of the year of Lucas Afonso. He is one of the speakers. So on his PG thesis, he got this idea to introduce uh, a notion of contour for long range systems. So we wrote a couple of papers and. Uh, in this conference, in the in the Wednesday, they, we have another difference with for the random easing model, which is the, the main topic of the conference, and uh, we have all other other uh, other uh, works in going on, and so we will try to to use this space to collaborate with you and we people that is coming to this uh, workshop. So I have to to say uh, thank you for the institute of the, the EMUSP that uh, he is supporting us uh, in, in many ways. And also the thematic project of uh, uh, which the coordinator is Fabio Prats Machado, and uh, which is the stochastic modeling interact interacting systems is, uh, is this kind of a big project here in FAPESP and he is one of the sponsors of this conference. So I hope that you enjoy the week. We have uh, a dinner on Wednesday this night. So please uh, fill the form. I have to, 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 to say the restaurant how many people will go in there. And uh, okay, so let's uh, introduce uh, Christoph Kusko uh, from Bochum. And uh, he will speak about uh, on the stream of the composition of free state uh, for finite spin models on Kelly trees. So thank you. So thank you, Rodrigo. So it's a great pleasure to be here in this beautiful place, Brazil. And uh, thank you also uh, to the Institute and the sponsors and also, of course, uh, the organizing committee for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to uh, speak here. So uh, this will have at least in spirit also something to do with a topic that Rodrigo mentioned, because uh, we will also see contour models, for instance, and good sides, bad sides, and things like that. Okay, so uh, this is a joint work with a number of people who are listed here. In a more narrow sense, this is actually uh, going to be work with Lorraine Coquille from Grenoble and uh, Anouligny from Paris. And uh, so here you see uh, a fraction of a binary tree. So we will look at Cayley trees more generally as a supporting space for the models we are interested in. So they will be infinite trees, of course. And so here's the outline. Uh, so <coughs> I will talk about um, Uh, models uh, which are supported on Cayley trees and have finite local state spaces. And uh, we think of them uh, as, so that could be written as a, let's say, uh, finite alphabet with uh, generic letters, but we like to write it in the form of ZQ. You know? So because we can add and subtract, so ZQ uh, 0, 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, and uh, <coughs> so then uh, our models will be nearest neighbor models. Think, for example, of the POTS model. Uh, and uh, more generally, we will talk about clock models. So these, these have a discrete rotational invariance. So think of something like a discrete uh, Heisenberg model, but I mean this uh, could be much more general. But not for all parts of the talk. Uh, we need the symmetries I will talk about later. And then uh, I will tell you something about states. First of all, at low temperature, they are uh, localized states. This you know well, <coughs> this is a standard thing. For instance, in the POTS model, you have these states if this is single side marginal, that at low temperature, the single side marginals uh, tend to concentrate maybe on uh, one of the spin values, but they are also more general states with non-singleton concentration sets. And then uh, I will come more into to the direction of 
the extreme decomposition uh, uh, issue, namely the extreme decomposition for the free state, let's say, of the POTS model. So, um, so this extreme decomposition is far from being trivial. Uh, so it's been long for, uh, known for a long time that for the easing model, at a low enough temperature, so the free state, what is the free state? Let's think of an easing model. You take uh, open boundary conditions, and that gives you also a free, that gives you a state in the infinite volume, which is also a Gibbs measure. And uh, so <coughs> at low enough temperature, it ceases to be extremer. Yeah? But uh, unlike uh, the situation with lattice, it's not a symmetric combination between mu plus and mu, uh, mu minus, but rather it's something much more complicated. It spreads over continuity of states. And this is a general thing, and this general thing we like uh, to uh, investigate in uh, this talk. And uh, it is uh, result together with Loren and Anu. Okay, and <coughs> so uh, our method of proof will use so-called branch overlap. So this is a method we, we kind of invented, and it will be based on Pyatt's bound, let's say, with errors good side, bad side decomposition, and so on, you will see. Also, there are different uh, um, questions uh, having to do with boundary law formalism, and this leads us uh, more into an analytic realm, you know, into analytic questions of <coughs> solutions, multiple solutions of nonlinear equations, finite dimensional or even infinite dimensional equations. And uh, so maybe I will not focus too much on, on it. And uh, uh, so, oh, all right. Uh, okay, so more precisely, a bit more technical, uh, what are the states we are interested in? Okay, so we have uh, our infinite regular tree. We have vertex set uh, V, we have H set E. We have a degree D, so that means every side has d plus one nearest neighbor. And we have this local side space, uh, local state space, sorry, that's uh, the finite alphabet here written as the group dq, where you can add uh, mod q. And then we have the infinite volume configurations, so uh, assigning to any vertex, little d in the capital V vertex that uh, spin value here. And then, uh, you know, we are doing a Gibbs measure in the infinite volume. Uh, you know the DLR formalism, I assume. Fine, yes. So that means uh, we <coughs> translate our interaction into a collection of finite volume Gibbs measures, gamma lambda, and uh, these gamma lambdas are kernels. Yeah, what are they? Uh, the lambda is a finite volume, uh, a sub a sub volume of the tree in our case. So if it's connected, it's a subtree. For instance, these two sides. And then, uh, <coughs> what does the measure do in equilibrium statistical mechanics? It uh, takes a boundary condition in the second slot here. Yeah, so it has an dependence on a configuration here. And with respect to the first, it is uh, a measure. It's a probability measure. So and the probability measure gives way to see the configuration omega lambda. For instance, one, two, three, uh, one, two, um, depending on the boundary condition according to such a formula. So the Q is somehow the weight associated to an edge where these variables omega x, omega y are sitting. And uh, <coughs> of course, it's derived from the energies of the model. And uh, <coughs> all right, I, I mean, uh, so the, the edges uh, you have to take into account. On our case, the graph, uh, which is a tree, uh, are inside the volume, but also connecting to the outside. And this stuff is uh, spatially Markovian in the sense uh, that the boundary condition dependence, which could be in principle very long range for, for normal Gibson model here, is only via the nearest neighbor. So this we call spatial Markovianness. All right, and then let me give you <coughs> a background notion about tree index Markov chains. Everybody knows Markov chains indexed by discrete times, let's say by the natural numbers. Um, <coughs> and here, tree index Markov chain is a natural generalization. So um, first of all, it's done not with respect to any Gibbs distribution. We simply have a measure, probability measure, on uh, <coughs> the infinite volume configurations of the same form. And when is it a tree index Markov uh, chain, let's say a homo homogeneous tree index Markov chain, 
which looks the same from every side and from, from any uh, edge. So <coughs> if it can be uh, obtained in the following way, you sample um, on a arbitrarily chosen root uh, vertex, which you call D, yeah, maybe, uh, the sigma zero, which is the spin at this vertex, according to the single side marginal of mu. And then if you are interested, let's say, in the uh, joint distribution of these one, two, three, four spins, you do the following conditional on what the choice here was, you uh, apply your transition matrix to get to here. So this is like you do in the one dimensional uh, Markov chain, but you do it also independently yeah, here. So uh, if this were, let's say, one, then you apply this P1 omega W and this P1 uh, omega W prime for to, to get the distribution on these things. And then you go to the outside and you iterate. Okay, so this gives you uh, finite volume marginals for any finite volume and they're consistent. So if you take larger volume and you project down to a smaller volume, you get a consistent formula. So therefore by Kolmogorov uh, extension theorem, you get an infinite volume map. So this is how sh we should intuitively think about a true index Markov chain. And um, <clears throat> here's an abstract definition, uh, which also works uh, for the situation where you don't have this homogeneity. So because it could be that the, these transition operators, these transition matrices depend on the edge where you are. And uh, so in order for an infinite volume measure mu to be a true index Markov chain, the following needs to hold. Uh, you have to check any oriented edge now. So here's a, an oriented edge, VW, and it divides uh, this set of vertices into a path. Okay, so this is the past of this oriented edge, and this is the future of this oriented edge. You're asking yourself, what's the probability distribution uh, of sigma W, the spin at W, conditional that you know the, the whole infinite path which kind of branches off. And if it's true that it depends only on the immediate path, you know, then uh, it's a true index Markov chain. So these are sigma algebras, and path uh, of uh, oriented edge VW is a set of, I mean, this, this half tree. And the F is then generated by the sigma algebra here, so this non iteration of the chain. There's no loop because we are, uh, exactly, because uh, we are on uh, a tree. So that only works for trees. Just know what yeah. Okay, so then we have important background theorem. If you have an extremal Gibbs measure, now, okay, now we, we are talking about Gibbs measure. Yeah. Suppose that uh, we have a, <coughs> a Gibbsian specification, like a Markovian Gibbsian specification, and we are interested in uh, one particular Gibbs measure. There can be many Gibbs measures. And uh, so if it's extremal, so if it's not decomposable, uh, then uh, it must be a tree index Markov chain. So that's an abstract theorem which is beautifully uh, abstractly proved in uh, the book by Aguirre. You can see it. I mean, it's uh, playing with the sigma algebras at infinity from the right, from the left, and so on and so forth. The other one is not true. No? In general, this is wrong. This is not true. Because if it were true, then the whole talk would be empty and the whole study of the free, free uh, measure. If so, that this free measure, <coughs> for instance, of a POTS model, um, this is three index Markov chain, but the interesting can be at high temperature, extremal, of course, but at low temperature, it's not extremal. And uh, so this is an example of uh, the fact that the, this opposite uh, implication does not hold. Okay, now what are the models uh, <coughs> which I like uh, uh, to study? So think of the POTS model maybe at first. Okay, so the POTS model uh, has interaction between nearest neighbors, V and W, and uh, it's, uh, what does it do? I mean, it looks uh, whether along an edge uh, the omega V spin is equal or not equal to the omega W. And if you have a, such a mismatch, then you pay uh, an amount of energy, let's say one, and put <coughs> Later, we will put also a meter, you know? But uh, we want to consider, or we can consider it, let's say, not, uh, yeah, I mean, we want to consider more general models, namely, uh, which we call ferromagnetic nearest neighbor models, where you have 
So again, interaction only between neighboring sites, and uh, you pay an amount of energy. So if uh, at this oriented bond you have I J configuration, uh, you simply Q, you pay an amount of energy U I J. And we want to assume, and this is why we call them ferromagnetic, if um, they are not the same. If they are the same, then you pay nothing. But if they are not the same, you pay at least a little u. And because they have only finitely many choices, of course, the maximum is uh, finite. And we call the maximum capital U. And this we call sort of little u capital U models. OK. Uh, <coughs> OK, so then uh, there is an important subclass, which are these uh, clock models I uh, introduced already earlier, so this discrete rotator, and this is simply where this energy, so the change along an edge from I to a J, is a function only of the distance of I and J, that's the absolute value I to J, in this uh, group DQ. Uh, so in, for instance, if you have D5, uh, then uh, along an edge you might not change at all, then the distance is uh, zero, and the potential is zero, because we have to do this, and if you change uh, by one amount, maybe you pay more for some reason because it's the choice of the potential, then you, you pay capital U and you pay two amount. If you change two amount, you pay uh, a little U in this case. And note that also these clock models has, uh, have as one Gibbs measure of interest discrete state. So if we take uh, three boundary conditions, we um, get a family of measures again. And so we don't need uh, any complicated DLR formalism, if, if you like. Uh, we simply have the system of all the measures we can start. OK. And uh, what we can also do, so this are, I will formulate uh, the theorem um, in, in this form. So these are, uh, we can also take local potential terms, psi here. I want to take to take them in a homogeneous way, so they should be the same at every site. And uh, so we still have for our uh, nearest neighbor potential this little u capital U condition. And uh, let's uh, assume that we have uh, that the subnorm uh, of this one is dominated by this one. So this allows for asymmetric um, asymmetric uh, fields. But they should be still, in some sense, controllable by this. OK, so now I want to, want to bring, if I have this term with Hitonian, the model in the form with this transition, um, with this Q. Yeah? And what we have to do is I have to take a Q. I take an additional parameter in the temperature beta to scale up the energy to make things low temperature if the beta is large. I have this um, nearest neighbor thing, which is here written, and B is VW. And uh, this is the way to do it in a symmetric way, to split the field term at the vertex V in um, a symmetric way over the D plus 1 edges, which are coming in into a vertex V. We had on the D regular G, D plus 1 nearest neighbors. And so we should take a lot of products here uh, in the formula, which I've been writing here. Uh, then, for instance, at this one, three of the Qs are coming together, and it uh, gets you back the full psi of the configuration at this vertex. All right. OK, uh, so what about the free state analog for such models? OK, so let's first maybe think of the easing model, because this might, you may know. So if we have an uh, easing model, low temperature, you have the free state. It is an interesting measure. If you turn on the magnetic field a tiny bit, uh, the state is not destroyed, but it, it, it goes into a state which is a small perturbation of that. Yeah. So um, this you can also do for the model, or more generally, this game you can also do for clock models, for which have this discrete rotation symmetry. You turn on a, a small enough um, local perturbation. And uh, what happens then, think this is the single side distribution, for instance, for a Q-state model, for, for a three-state model here, then uh, the single side distribution in the free state is in the middle. So it's the exit distribution. It, it will be um, deformed a little and will, will move here. Okay? So in this, is, this can be what I'm saying in words. This is actually an analytic thing. 
You have to look at the recursion equations and the so-called boundary equations when you have to perturb them. And it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of application of implicit function theorem in a, in a suitable way. And let me not talk too much about it because the time is over. It's also interesting, etc. But uh, let me go more to the statistical mechanics. Okay. So anyway, so the message is, I mean, you can get for small fields, for instance, and also if you perturb the clock thing to something more general and the perturbation is not too big, you can get natural analogs and these these we call central states. Uh, so these are natural deformations of the free states. Okay. Good, here's background literature. The three papers is Loren and Arno. And uh, so these are more analytic papers with the other co-authors. And here uh, we are sitting a bit on some ideas of the easing model of these authors, in particular, uh, free easing model on a tree about extreme decomposition. And uh, have good, intu uh, good intuitive arguments and so on. Uh, all right, and here, this is also some some uh, very old paper in an apparently completely different situation on the lattice, low temperature behavior, which are mostly, but not always, thermosmetic. And uh, so uh, this they can handle with a good side, bad side approach, with some contour techniques, which are nice because they are not as complicated as, for instance, for an increase easing model, Brickman could be Einen, very complicated, but they also have a good side, bad side ideology and this you know somehow digest and apply it to, to the situation all right so uh, I, I will give you this interview and some somehow some results that came um, out of mostly analytic arguments so with our uh, Italian and uh, one, one German co-author and two Italian co-authors So think, uh, for instance, of a POTS model. We put ourselves on a, a tree, which is really a deep clean unit. And um, so then the following holds. Let me say it to you at first informally. So you have these states where the, at low temperature, the thing is like Mars, and they, they like to sit on one of the spin values, let's say on the spin value two or on, on the spin value three. But you also have these other states, and they are actually particular to the tree. They are not convex combination of the previous ones, uh, where you have uh, <coughs> states which concentrate in an indecomposable way on a subset of uh, the local spin space. For instance, uh, you could have um, A equal to, let's say, 2 and 3, B5, and uh, there are three index Markov chains, so which the single side margin denoted by pi is almost a contribution on uh, the these two uh, sides. Okay, so see an analytic uh, theory for that. The operator is a clock model of this form. We call this function u bar. Uh, so the energy which you have to pay if you increase uh, along an edge by the amount of absolute value. And it, it gives us a certain low temperature condition formulated in e plus one half norm. So what's that? The Q zero uh, is taking values from ZQ. Uh, U bar at zero was zero. So e, e function is one, you subtract this one in the zero and you get a vector. And e to the minus beta times something which is positive tends to be small. And the, the good note of smallness is really to look at this uh, vector in some RQ in this d plus one half norm. Okay, and then uh, you have, um, let me not go to, to it too much. You have these states, you can, can characterize them, and also quantitatively characterize them, and it's based on a fixed part method. So why I'm saying this, uh, because uh, later we want to investigate also these states. And um, by the way, this theorem was proved by explicit computation in joint work with Utkir, Uzikov and uh, Uzbekian uh, co-author, where a lot of computations can be made in the POTS model because you have the permutation. And maybe what's worthwhile to note is that you also have a version of the theorem for an unbounded spin model, like the SOS model. SOS model is uh, where you have a gradient model uh, with unbounded spins, p-valued spins, uh, integer-valued spins, 
But then uh, you must assume something for the queue, you know, you must assume something for the interaction. You need uh, to uh, have that they are in a suitable space. And why is this D plus one half coming? Yeah, it's coming for reasons of young inequality and the necessity to control some, some fixed point equations. Okay. So, um, so these are interesting states, uh, little known, and they exist for these clock models. Okay. So this is um, the first part. And now let me come to my main part of the talk, namely this uh, extreme uh, decomposition issue. So I think that's all. If you want to ask me later, please do. Okay, um, <clears throat> so there's a first theorem, which was also uh, motivated by these authors, which are almost the authors, um, uh, Gandolfo Ruiz Schlossmann, 2012, almost the author of Gandolfo Marcus, Schlossmann of 2020, uh, for the easy model. And we borrow from ideas for the easy model and put them further for uh, general models into uh, automorphic is already going to later. Okay, so, so this is the first of our paper of our co collaboration with Lorenz and Arnaud, uh, and appears in Journal of Statistical Physics. So we put our general ferromagnetic model assumption, but let's say we put not uh, external fields in the first approach here for the theorem. So we have this minimal amount of energy to be paid along a non-constant uh, edge and we have the, the maximum amount of energy. Okay, what does the theorem say? Uh, we have ground states which can be not homogeneous. And uh, so ground states, so this will be um, a set of configurations, infinite volume configurations. They uh, depend on two parameters. D is the degree on, of the graph of the tree in which we, which we play the whole thing. And D max is the number which is smaller than D. Okay. And so these are the set of configurations are called here omega zero. So in our infinite volume configuration space on the D regular tree for which the degree of a graph of broken edges is small enough. So what's that? Uh, oh, look, I mean, so this is a subset of the edge of edges. Uh, so um, it's un unoriented edges. And so what do you do uh, um, for each edge v, w, you simply check whether you change in the configuration or not. Okay, so for instance, here we have a Q uh, equals three state POTS model. Uh, the degree of the tree is four. So if uh, that means that we have five neighbors, for instance, this guy has these four neighbors, this has one neighbor. And then uh, we look at uh, the uh, omega zero, and for instance, if you have configuration two here, and uh, value one here, this is a broken edge. So if you have one and one, this is not a broken edge, a broken bond. And uh, this, if you have one and zero, this is also a broken bond. And what's the degree? Uh, the degree is clearly one. Degree is the maximal number of incoming broken bonds which you could find anywhere on the, for any side. So here uh, you have uh, no broken bonds coming in. You have one broken bond coming in, and here is one broken bond coming in. Okay. And this will play some role. Okay. And then uh, it says uh, under the following condition, it's uniform sparsity condition for this graph of the broken bonds. Uh, so this is a disconnected graph of two broken bonds, namely that the degree of the tree in which we embed the whole thing times little u, minimal cost also to be paid uh, by for, for a broken edge, is bigger than d max. d max in our case, for instance, is one times capital U plus little u. If this holds, then at low enough temperature, you can expect around these things. And uh, at low enough you have Gibbs states which are perturbations of these configurations. First of all, these configurations are ground states at all. 
in the sense that if you do a finite volume exaggeration, uh, so finite volume change of this configuration omega zero, for instance, this one, you actually uh, have to pay energy. So energy will go up. Uh, so this one has to digest. You can ha have a lot of non-flatness on the T, but still these things are ground state, and even you can expand the ground state. Yeah. Okay, here's the theorem. I mean, there exists a beta zero depending on D, D mark, Q, of course, the number of spin values, little u, minimal energy to be paid, maximal energy to be paid, uh, such that if the beta, so the actual uh, inverse temperature of the model is larger than this thing, you have a family of inhomogeneous Gibbs measures which are indexed by this uh, sufficiently sparse omega zero uh, ground state. Uh, uh, so they are indexed in a unique way. That means if you take a different one, uh, omega zero and omega tau zero, then uh, the states are really different ones. They are also extremal. This you can see by looking at the correlation decay. And it's, it's a consequence of cluster expansion. And <coughs> so there are um, uh, low temperature excitations. For instance, uh, this can be formulated in, in the way. So if you take the measure, the infinite volume measure mu, which uh, is supposed to be perturbation of the omega zero at a large enough beta, okay, so then these things uh, exist and extremal. And they are also, let's say, with the eyes of single slide marginals, close to this reference state. Uh, so, uh, so this spin variable is drawn from this measure here. This is the reference state, which is also used uh, for, for the measure. And so the probability that you have a match, that your actual spin variable uh, normally fluctuates away from the eye. So this is uh, close to one, up to exponential growth in beta. So this is the theorem, okay, and it's based on uh, cluster expansion. Okay, and uh, uh, maybe it's interesting, <coughs> so also for the case of gradient models in Z, uh, with this particular uh, SOS type interaction, the classical SOS of T equal one, but with also other T's, we have an analogous theorem, but it's a bit, bit more complicated. So we have also set of ground states. More generally, it's written in wrong. Okay. Uh, more generally, um, also uniformly small, but even inhomogeneous fields could be allowed. So it, uh, this puts us a bit uh, in the realm of random field easing model. If you have random fields, let's say for a POTS model, but they are uniformly small, small enough, then uh, this is still true. Then the whole cluster expansion gain it's still possible, but all these weights will be not, but can be uniformly controlled. And, uh, so if you are specialized in this model, but uh, you the price to pay along a non-homogeneous edge, the edge is one, but also it doesn't get bigger than one. I mean, what model only looks whether you're changing from one to two, or whether you're changing from one to five doesn't matter. So the little capital U is strong. So this is one, this is two. No. So these are the U, and you get this condition. Okay. Yeah, the least is one. So uh, E has four, and uh, so that means the small degree of C from which you started, for which this theory works, and you look back here, this was five. So for instance, for this particular uh, graph of broken edges, you can make a cluster expansion around it, around this configuration, and this works for the box model. And for other models, it's a different condition. Even higher requirement on this team. This, by the way, was uh, what uh, um, Gandolfo Ruiz Lothman did for the model. is you can have non-homogeneous ground states and uh, perturb around them, but they need to be sort of uniformly sparse broken from ground state. So what is, what is 
difficult is would be to have um, states which you sort of feel that they are ground states, but you have clusters of broken ones coming together. So that that uh, is not possible directly to do these types of experiments. And then now come <coughs> towards the but uh, the, the real issue of the extremal decomposition. Nevertheless, what I told you before will be used at least as, as an intuition. Uh, because uh, we will see <coughs> somehow one feels that these states which have been constructed there, which live around non-homogeneous ground states, they should appear in the extremal decomposition of the free matter. So this is some, some intuition that for the evening model was somehow uh, given by uh, Gandolfo Marcius. Okay, so uh, I have to, uh, I'm sorry I have to bother you with generalities uh, uh, about extreme decomposition. So DLR measures are the Gibbs measures defined by the DLR equation mu gamma lambda mu. And uh, so uh, this is, um, as you know, <coughs> Um, linear equation for the mu, as you see, and so convex conditions uh, are in. So we have um, Gibbs measures any convex combination to Gibbs measure T. And so one is interested in the non composer and these are the mu is in the extreme Gibbs measures with calligraphic G of gamma, gamma is the specification, so defined by Newtonian. Then, um, so extremals are characterized by the fact that they are tail trivial. Uh, so uh, you know from a zero one law for independent uh, processes, so there's a tail sigma algebra. So this here on the lattice is uh, the intersection of all the sigma algebras outside of lambda. Lambda is finite volume, and as lambda t collects all the inter information you can you can get uh, by things happening outside of the volume. Okay, and these uh, these uh, the sigma algebra at infinity are those events which are not influenced if you change uh, any finite uh, number of spin values. And the tail triviality says that mu a uh, should be the number zero or one. Okay, and also you have uh, short range correlation, so meaning if you have any uh, event, you can think of cylinder event a, you can also uh, non cylinder event, doesn't matter. And uh, you take another event B, and the B is in the sigma algebra outside of the lambda. Lambda finite volume, uh, let's say a large one. So these con correlations, they become small, and if you let the lambda tend to infinity, so they become uniformly small in uh, the B. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> then what we will need uh, for the construction and for the discussion of the extremal decomposition. So this is how the general theory goes. It's what Schlossmann and co-authors call the Gibbs measure at infinity. But it's actually a subtle uh, measure theoretic object. So what do you do? I mean, you're looking at your Gibbs measure, uh, finite volume lambda with the boundary condition uh, omega outside. And then you're trying to perform a limit uh, along, uh, let's say, co-finite sequence. I think on the three, you're taking an expanding ball going to infinity to exhaust your uh, vertex set of the three, which uh, before I denoted by B, I should also denote by B. And uh, so, of course, it could happen that this does not converge. What does it mean, converge? Yeah, so here we have discrete spin model. We, we check against local patterns. Yeah. This is the same as the convergence in this case. So it might be that it uh, does not converge, but it might also be that it converges weakly. And if it converges uh, weakly, uh, you say, ah, oh, it's wonderful, I am getting a measure. And if you're not converging for a particular omega, you're redefining it by some arbitrary measure which has the same goal. And putting this together, you get a kernel. And this kernel pi omega, in the first slot, it's a Gibbs measure. And here it's a measurable function. And this is the central object which uh, gets you your extreme decomposition. The whole extreme decomposition theory, uh, if you read the book, they all be uh, based on Dünken and Kolmar and other people. So it's a beautiful theory of how the extreme decomposition is happening. So the first theorem is uh, now, uh, if you take mu a Gibbs measure for a given specification, gamma, 
so mu is now another Gibbs member. Then this limit exists almost surely for almost any mu. Uh, so this is basically this uh, backwards martingale theorem plus plus more uh, considerations. So the limit exists, and also it's an extreme Gibbs measure with, in the first slot. Um, so, so almost any mu. Okay, and so. Uh, let, let me uh, break a little and talk about uh, the free easing model. And uh, so for the free easing model, uh, it was known that you have uh, a transition. So free state of the easing model zero field is extreme if and only if D tends in hyperbolic beta with inverse temperature squared, less or equal one. So this was proved by Di Majorse and uh, uh, Blecher and uh, so discussed by these people. And so this is interesting because it happens at a, diff at a different temperature than the temperature where the easy model has a phase transition. Easy model has a phase transition meaning that mu plus measure is different from mu minus measure at a different uh, critical value. And you have an intermediate temperature range where the free state is uh, still extreme. Eh? Although you have a mu plus not equal to mu minus, and then you will go even lower, and then the free state it really decomposes. And so that, that the question was in, in what, in which measures does it decompose, and what are the properties of this extreme decomposition stuff? And uh, so there's also a theorem implying, given the Kessin Spiegel bound, where you can see that the measure, um, when the measure will not decay trivial. Let me, let me not go it into it too much for use of time. And, uh, but let me mention that this Kessin Spiegel bound is sharp for the easing, but not always sharp for cross. So, this is interesting stuff. Uh, and there's a nice uh, complicated paper where a lot of cases, but not all cases, are treated by slide for the energy quality. Okay, so once again, we are after the nature of the extreme or composition of the free or more general central space. So think about the, the free pots model and all kind of uh, variations of this. We are using a different uh, approach, which does not assume symmetry. Okay, and to prepare this approach, I still um, have to give, give you now this background how this high kernel we just introduced. So intuitively, this Gibbs measure with boundary condition omega at infinity, which is always extreme with respect to its uh, dependence. How this generates you the extreme decomposition. Okay. Um, so the Gibbs measures uh, associated with classification gamma are convex a set of the probability subset of probability measures. We recall that we denote the extreme boundary by this x d gamma. So these are the extreme elements. And so then the theorem about the extreme decomposition says take any mu, which is a Gibbs measure solution of the LR equation, and uh, you can decompose it into a convex combinations of extremes. Uh, you, you, but you might need more than two or three or co countably many. You might need uncountably many. And so abstractly, this uh, theorem says something like this. So the mu can be represented as an integral over extreme Gibbs space with some decomposition measure alpha mu, which depends on the mu. So in, in, in a very naive uh, extreme Gibbs measure, then uh, you have one Gibbs measure mu, which is not extreme, and you can decompose it in a unique way on this simplex in terms of I don't know what, you know, certain uh, percentages of this, this, and this with that to one. Okay, so here's some uh, measure theoretic stuff. In order to make this work, you need to, to put sigma algebras, and there's the notion of so called evaluation sigma algebra, which lives on all these spaces of measure. Okay, so small sigma algebra which makes all evaluation maps measurable with respect to measure, which makes measure of A measurable with respect to the sigma algebra for the measure. Okay. okay, now, but this is the crucial formula. So, what is then the probability? I mean, what, what is this decomposition measure? So, the, the decomposition measure is 
obtained from the pi kernel in from the measure which you want to decompose this new. Um, and it is defined in such a way. So let M be now a subset, a measurable subset um, of these extremal elements, or more generally in the sigma algebra um, for, for the extremal Dixon attack. For, for instance, these two, let's say here. Yeah? So then the probability in the decomposition measure to get these two measures here is uh, the following. You sample the omega at infinity according to the mu which you, you want to decompose. You put it into the pi. So the pi spits you out an extremal measure and uh, you simply see for how many omegas you, you get this measure and for how many omegas you get this measure. But this is a completely general formula. And you could also say it's the push forward of the original measure which you want to decompose under this kernel. The kernel takes this on, on the condition omega spits you out an extremal measure and so this is, this, is, this is the relevance of this pi to extremal decomposition. So that I tested a bit and get used to it. But it's not so. so this is classic. Okay, and now we come closer and closer to the theorem. Uh, so, um, of course, if, if we have given, we need to say something about this pi. This is boundary condition omega s infinity. This we will be doing. It. And um, so, <clears throat> in order to cover not just these block models, I need one last, small, very simple definition. Namely, for those central states, which, which generalize a bit to the case of uh, non zero fields, these uh, free state clock model uh, simple change in its parameter, we call it. But I mean, if we have three index markers from which we can generate our measure, then uh, we're looking uh, along an edge of this transition matrix, which is the same for every edge. And uh, so uh, let I be the state uh, in the starting vertex and J be the state in the final vertex and we see what's the probability to get from I to a state which is not equal to I. Yeah. So that's the probability to change if we go from I. Then we simply take the max of it and this we call a P1. Also it's the max over. So in, if the P1 is very small, we say the chain is uh, very lazy. It doesn't like to change. And it's elementary to see if you have this uh, three states of our UU clock models. The minimal amount uh, that you have to pay for this guy is um, the minimal amount of energy is uh, little u. And uh, so you, this, this thing is something like uh, at least e to the minus theta little u times some normalization, which is harmless. And so this goes very fast to zero, so this is completely elementary. But in a, in a general case, this is some, simply an assumption. If we have, let's say, external feeds of this, the chain which we would like to decompose doesn't like to change a lot, a lot like this. Okay. Now it's the first result uh, for the central states that they are really uh, non-extremal at low temperature. And uh, this is a, a reconstruction bar. It's, it's an easier theorem as the decomposition theorem. I will come to it in a second. So here is um, general assumption, central state for UU model and uniform smallness in the system. So then what you do is the following. So this is a typical reconstruction type theorem. You are starting with the state. You're conditioning it at the origin to take a particular spin value A. Let's say A equal to Okay, then uh, you propel with this mu to the outside in order to construct the measure uh, by, this, by the Markov chain, uh, three index Markov chain property, you simply have to apply your chain and you get a full measure. And then you are trying to re reconstruct from observations extremely far away, let's say outside of a, a volume of the radius of, uh, I don't know, the universe. And uh, so ideally, of course, then you're looking at the boundary condition at infinity, this tail measurable thing. And then you, you are putting this omega, which you constructed from this, in your reconstruction device. And your reconstruction device is this kernel at infinity. 
And uh, what you would like to do, if you can reconstruct, you want, if I'm, I'm sending A equal to, this guy is, this is a probability distribution, which is random, this is my zero under condition that I reconstruct it here. Yeah. Um, and I want it to be close to one, and in fact, it is true. I mean, so uh, so this omega chosen from this measure condition, given that the uh, orange bin to be A, is almost fully sitting on the sigma zero equal A. So the smaller these errors are, so the better the reconstruction is. And this guy is sort of depending on uh, uh, yeah. So we have two sorts of errors. Yeah. As a consequence, uh, by decomposing the measure mu with respect to the possible spin values here, we see that this guy is a non-trivial k measure, I mean a non-constant k measurable observable, hence the mu was not a Now I, I come to our main uh, result. Let's say main non-quantitative result. Okay. It's the almost same extremis, namely of pi kernel under the product measure of the measure we want to decompose. So again, in this class of nearest neighbor models, uh, fulfilling our minimal uh, maximal energy, little u, capital U bound, and pair potential, and you have this uniform smallness uh, that the simplified terms are bounded by d minus one times the u times one. Okay, so then if the inverse temperature is large enough, and if the laziness parameter is small enough, then if we do the following, we take the we want to decompose and choose with respect one of these in the product, the pi infinity, the first one, and we compare it to a omega pi that is infinity chosen from the second one. And then what is happening is that they are almost purely singular. So um, this means singularity. So these measures are extremely Gibbs, uh, extreme Gibbs measures. Extreme Gibbs measures are fully I mean okay, so by, by the property of extreme Gibbs measures by the way equivalent to saying that they're not equal. If they are not equal, they they have to be um, singular to each other. And uh, a corollary of this statement, so of the almost pure singularity of the pi kernel. So this is omega, omega prime chosen from product measure is that this decomposition measure, which is induced by the pi, cannot have any atoms. So this means that the decomposition is on a continuity of space. It's impossible. Because if it had any atoms, then this would were impossible. I mean, if this is chosen, uh, is choosing, let's say, with probability one half, one measure mu one, this is chosen with probability one half and uh, the same as mu one, you would get at least with probability one fourth that uh, the, these things are the same, so it cannot be. It works uh, if you assume that they are living on a constant set. And the technique of our proof here goes the core idea, which was from uh, taken from Schlossmann co authored from the Easy model, is so we look at this chi kernel. We compare the pi kernel with the boundary condition omega to the condition itself. Uh, so of course, this is a mass, this is an omega. And the idea is that they should be close. I mean, the first theorem, when, when the omega were uh, uniform, uh, too many uh, broken edges coming together, then one could even do uh, expansions and then, uh, for instance, uh, the, these measures would be controllable uh, perturbations, expansions, omega. But still, so this this is the intuition. I mean, they should resemble the omega, maybe not everywhere in space, but most 
And this would hold for typical uh, uh, configurations of omega. So what is the problem? The omega has to be chosen from the mu itself. Mu, for instance, free state of Cobb's model, let's say at a low temperature. Let's say extremely low temperature. What will, what will the condition, the, the omega look like? It will be uh, mostly homogeneous, and then we'll have few uh, broken bonds. But unfortunately, uh, the broken bonds will come together somewhere in space. I mean, by Boric and Kelly, et cetera, et cetera. This is where you get clusters of broken bonds somewhere. And this smells a bit like, you know, a disorder. And so that's a useful way of thinking about these omegas chosen from the mu, which is not an independent matter in general, of course, and then uh, applying it here. So the idea is somehow to look at these high kernels, uh, conditional on the omega, with omega playing the role of some disorder, uh, typically looking flat, not many, many, many broken ones, but sometimes they do. Okay, and we want somehow then to, to get this proof of uh, almost first thing we'll have to build up a pale measurable observable um, we have to distinguish uh, a pi omega from a pi omega prime which allows if you're computing expectations to see that they and so our idea was to build uh, uh, what we call a branch overlap so here's primary tree here's the one branch going to infinity so we, we take a sufficiently sparse subset of V1, V2, V3, etc., which have some spacings, and the spacings will be defined later. So they have to, to grow sufficiently sparse. Then we divide by the volume. We look at the empirical sum of this mismatches. And then we take in order to have this quantity exist within it. Okay, so this object takes an omega, takes a sigma, and it is insens insensitive towards uh, changes in any finite volume, so it's a measurable observable for omega and for sigma. And we will apply it by choosing the omega typically from, from the mu and uh, choosing these things then from the pi kernel condition of this. And then the statement will be like this, so from which everything follows, that's what we call concentration of the branch overlap. Suppose our general assumptions, then we have some epsilon and beta going to zero errors. Epsilon two of P1 of this laziness parameter, which comes zero as the laziness gets larger, so P1 gets to zero, such that we can construct deterministic sets so that this branch overlap, the tachyonyms of it, is really close to one. Okay, it's close to one. Um, up to errors epsilon 1 of beta epsilon 2 of p1. So the logic is you first draw uh, uh, an omega from the mu measure which you want to decompose and then you uh, sample the, the mat matches, you look at the matches if the sigma is chosen from the pi measure with boundary condition uh, omega. And the number of these mismatches is, the number of the mismatches, mismatches is small and the number of the matches is large. And so this allows you actually, so if the errors are small enough, so don't look at it too much, it's easy right hand side, uh, to distinguish now the pi kernel with an omega from the pi kernel with an omega prime. Because all that you need to distinguish matters is to have an observable which does the job for you that you get different things. And if you look, at this five, um, branch overlap with an omega, which you use in the construction of the pi itself, you get something which is close to one. But if you use it with a um, different omega prime, which is typically, I mean, chosen with respect to the product measure, you get something which is smaller. And this gives you the, the almost single. So that's an idea. And this one is from the normal contour on the tree. And uh, so, uh, what is the notion of, uh, of contour on a tree? That's the, let's say uh, we have any base configuration omega zero, uh, no assumption, but let's take a, a base configuration omega zero uh, as we had before. Uh, in, uh, so, where, where these were the broken bonds. Then you simply look at 
as we do in pure of finite theory, as we do in low temperature physics in general, you simply look at the number of mismatch, uh, at the um, incorrect points. Yeah? You, know, you, you want to build a contour which describes an omega relative to omega zero, so you look at the sides where you don't agree. And uh, then we have the following observation. These contours have never an uh, so if we now build a finite volume Gibbs measure gamma lambda finite volume, we take an omega zero, which is totally arbitrary here, um, with a boundary condition omega zero, and you look for the mismatch probability, then you can bound it by a contour sum. And you can do it nicely because, honestly, contours have no exterior, uh, interior. So if you have random field easing model on a, a, a decent complicated graph like a lattice, then you have all these problems when you switch uh, with interiors. And on the tree, you never have these interiors. This you always get. Problem is, of course, if the omega zero is anything, uh, then you won't get a nice uh, bounds on these uh, contributivities. And uh, so uh, you can, there's simply a definition which makes this correct. You have the excess energy of uh, what you hope to gain if you take an omega configuration and you look uh, relative to, to the omega zero reference configuration. Now, the problem is that you don't always gain, of course. And here's an excess energy lemma. So here's a reference configuration. Here is the excited configuration, which, of course, in general doesn't need to be excited at all. But, uh, good, you know. So the hope is, for instance, if this guy is, is flat, so has no broken bonds, then you gain by the amount of the volume of the contour times the minimal energy times something. But unfortunately, you have an undesirable term, namely having to do with these broken bonds of the reference configuration. And so the logic is if uh, you uh, look at the d of omega that were the broken bonds of the reference configuration, and you build a contour E, you build a contour gamma, and you hit on the contour too much of these uh, broken bonds of the reference configuration, it destroys your prior system. Okay, so here's the term for coming from the field. Let's not worry about this one, and this is the, the problem. And um, more precisely, we have to, to look not at the edges on the gamma, but also on the gammas which are attached to it, which uh, uh, sort of, if this is, uh, these three points are the gammas, and these are the edges that which are attached. So, so in order to make e expansions when they are possible, we need good composition. We take some delta zero threshold value, and uh, depending on these uh, parameters of the model, and then we define a site to be bad, or DV is a bad site for a given reference configuration omega. If the following is true, that uh, there exists a contour which is attached to the V, for instance, this is a site which picks up too, too many of these broken bonds. So uh, we define a bad set for, for contour gamma, and this is if you have that the edge intersected with these bad things coming from the omega. Delta C. Okay. For instance, in this picture, intuition is this side is maybe bad because you can build a very short contour which picks a lot of these bad things. You have a W here, which is very far away, a very long contour. You know, and if nowhere else in space, it, uh, you know, seems, uh, so, so then it looks like this W could be uh, not bad. And then uh, we have this uh, T lemma, technical T lemma that's controlling the mismatch probability in this uh, measure. So this is how sort of this extreme measure with the boundary condition omega, constructed with boundary condition omega. You look at any side D, ask for the mismatch probability. So two things can happen, that this side was not a bad side. So that means all the contours attached to the side, uh, they can be controlled as estimates. And then you're using, you know, this uh, thing. We are on the tree, so we have this thing. These things are bounded by e to the minus constant, maybe some whatever constant, small constant times the length of the gamma. So it can be summed using uh, 
Entropie ist, ob von Tor, Lemma und so on. Und so wird jetzt das in Epsilon 1 auf die Part. In the other case is that to find V was actually a bad part. Yeah, then it's too bad. Then it's bad. And if you simply uh, let this uh, stand as an indicator, depending on the condition omega, we define uh, by this. So there exists some contour. And then there are some technical things, uh, namely we are uh, able to control the probability that, uh, first of all, a contour is bad. So it's so if it's contour, we can sum this, and then we get an estimate on the probabilities of these uh, indicators for that size. Okay, another another point is uh, use for our sparse sequence along a branch of the tree, and use that we have decorrelation. I mean, these things are not strictly local because they involve evolve, involve uh, contours, which could be in principle very very long. But nevertheless, they decorrelate by cutting off long contours and using also Markov chain properties of this underlying um, uh, measure which generates the omega. Anyhow, so if you can you do this for to build a uh, almost sure convergence result, and there's another part which is the comparison of the mismatches, fixed omega. Now you something the sigma along uh, from from this pi kernel. And note that this is the expectation of this one with respect to pi kernel. And using some arguments and tricks, you can see that at least for very largely spaced arcs, they decorrelate. And then you put everything together. And what what was it that you wanted to show? You wanted to show this. Um, from you. Sigma samples from the pi kernel, and this is typically has very large overlap. And if you put together these ingredients, then you're done. And I think for your attention. So these are the, the very last steps to put things together. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we are out of the time, but uh, if someone has a question or a comment. No, just, just a, a speculative uh, question. Uh, uh, so you have uh, a continuous uh, number of extremal uh, games uh, measured, right? Yes. Uh, so you know that the, when the Arno and Violeta wrote this paper about chaoticity and, and the, so I mean, you 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 think that it's possible since you have a lot of extremo, maybe you can produce something which is is chaotic. You 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 have, you have space for inhomogeneous also, right? So maybe you can adjust. Uh, yeah. So uh, first of all, I mean uh, the the first theorem told us already that we have a lot of inhomogeneous uh, space. Because uh, namely, we, namely, we, namely, namely, we, uh, namely these ones, you know, with these, uh -huh. uh, with these sparse ground states. Now you're talking about perturbation. And, yeah. uh, oh, okay, so, so let me say, I mean, if you are, I know you're a bit after a spin lab, uh, you know, chaotic uh, temperature dependence. Yes, I, I mean, uh, my, because there is no ex really a, let's say a, phys a physical example. We did something dimensional too with Philippe, but it's very, let's say, uh, let's say you you construct a, a very specific potential to 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 but you to fall deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah, the, but I mean, may, may, maybe you think that it is possible to to construct something that is. Yeah, it's certainly interesting to look at it. I mean, let's say uh, on the level of the first theorem, we already had without any reference to extreme decomposition, this uh, theory which which gave us a lot. Uh, I mean, for any sufficiently sparse set of broken bonds, you get an extremely Gibbs measure. So these are uncountably many. Already. Okay. But uh, if you are looking for the same reference configuration in G states and you are perturbing the beta, it will be smooth uh, in uh, low enough. It, it will be like uh, having cluster extensions which are uh, undergoing a smooth perturbation. But so that's that's a different thing than looking really at the extreme decomposition. So that's of course a different issue and, and this is very interesting. Yes. 
Okay, so let's thank uh, Christoph again. Thank you. Okay, so the next speaker is Leandro Chiarini from Doha University. So it's with you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for inviting me uh, to have the opportunity to come here to USP. It's actually my first time uh, at USP, so I was very excited. Uh, and I realized that I made a terrible mistake naming the talk like this. It makes it look like it's strictly about PDEs when it's something that is more related to statistical mechanics. I mean, uh, my studies were more towards statistical mechanics, but then my research went a bit more to PDE side, like stochastic PDEs, but it was always informed by uh, statistical mechanics. So what is going to, what we're really going to do to start with, it's look at Gaussian fields, uh, which are like generalizations of GFF, like Gaussian free field. Uh, and before I really delve into it, I want to give an idea of why those models are even important. Like, what are the connections? What does it bring to statistical mechanics? So, well, so even before I start with these slides, um, the idea is that, suppose that we are looking at a statistical mechanics model in a discrete setting, in a graph with a discrete uh, uh, state space, you can define the measure of, e of each individual stage by like setting a number there, right? Like this is exactly what you would do with a using model or so on. If you have a continuous state space, you might do, it's still in the discrete setting of a graph, you will put a bag measure on each of the, uh, your vertexes and put like so, yeah, have an a priori measure, which is a bag measure and then put on top of Hamiltonian. So the standard thing to do. But what would you do after, like, if you're, instead of trying to put in a graph, if you really took the mesh size to zero, took a scaling limit, and how you would sample things uh, from, like, from this space. If I was trying to set a random variable associated to each point of the real numbers, or like the plane or something, turns out that there is no equivalent of uh, Lebesgue measure in this kind of setting. So you really have to do something else. One such way of doing this is putting instead like a Gaussian measure there because you can define Gaussian measures essentially anywhere. If you have a Hilbert structure to a space, uh, you are able to put a Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian measure there and then I could do things like, oh, if I wanted to define a priori uh, 
Hamiltonians of this sort and say like, well, I want to put an I priori measure here. And although things are messy, but like at least you have a candidate, for like you want to have a candidate for what those measures would be. Uh, but of course, like I could put a million different Gaussian measures there, but I want to somehow be informed by uh, underlying statistics, like by underlying model and by the underlying geometry of what I'm doing. Because I could, for instance, define the white noise, which is a, essentially putting an independent random variable in each point. But this is really messy and it's not going to give you any structure. Instead, we would really like to draw some uh, understanding from the underlying geometry of our space. And by geometry, uh, say like, so if we're in a graph or in a domain or on a manifold, you can do like understand geometry in several different ways. One such way of doing this is by looking at a Laplacian operator, which does give you information about the underlying graph or the underlying manifold, right? Um, people are able to understand a lot about the underlying manifold, the underlying domain, just by looking at the spectrum of the Laplacian. But we are probabilists here, so if you don't want to think this way, just think that, I mean, there would be a random walk in this setting, or like a Brownian motion, or whichever random process you have. And like there will be a generator associated to this random process, and I want to be informed by the law of like this diffusion that I'm letting happen either on the discrete or in the continuum. So this is really the base point for this. Uh, right. So then I can finally define the first type of model that I will look at, which is the GFF. Uh, this talk is going to be, like I, I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible, so I'll just do things in the torus, and I will, I will do things mostly in the discrete setting. We have like some other settings as well, already at the continuum level. But I want to, oh, oh yeah. Uh, I want to avoid as many technicalities as possible. I'm going to really rely on intuition here. Uh, so, as I said, I can define, uh, because I'm setting, like, in my discrete graph, which is the discrete torus, I'm putting a a priori Lebesgue measure here and putting a Hamiltonian that has to do with the difference of um, two neighbor, nearest neighbor points, uh, and I just want to keep this value small, right? I'm doing one small line here because, because I'm in the torus, this Hamiltonian wouldn't see if I shift every uh, if I shift a state by a constant, it wouldn't show up in the Hamiltonian at all, right? So I need a way of randomizing this. And the right way of doing this is by either setting one value to be equal to zero, or in my case, I'm really going to think as keeping the average, the uh, spatial average to be equal to zero. So little start there, but we don't need to worry too much about it. But one other way of uh, looking at this Hamiltonian, just like some green identities, you can see that this Hamiltonian is essentially minus the Laplacian uh, of my state, or of my configuration times the configuration. So the GFF, the Gaussian free field, tends to give um, good probabilities to functions that are close to harmonic. That's the idea. And you notice here that there is no, I'm not adding a beta because in the world of Gaussian free field and so on, if you multiply by a beta here, essentially just changing the variance and nothing really like is changing here. Like you might look at transitions by putting a mass, but there isn't, the, like the parameter beta doesn't really play a role here. Uh, yes. Right, ah, so yeah, and the, the here for me, this discrete Laplacian is given this way, which is very much the generator of the simple random walk. And you can think either in discrete or continuous time. Um, okay, yeah, so this is one way of defining the GFF, uh, but depending on where in the community you look at, people will prefer actually to think of, it's the Gaussian measure in like some setting, whose covariance structure is given by the green function of my uh, Laplacian operator. So. This is just a computation that you can do from the previous slide, uh, that if I do co try to compute the co covariance structure, it's going to be precisely the solution of the equation of the Poisson, uh, like so the green function here again, because I'm in the torus, I need to randomize this and ask for the boundary condition instead of a boundary condition is that the green function has spatial zero. But if you were in a domain, if you were on a you know, graph, you would put some uh, boundary conditions here, and those do play a role. All right, um, 
there is uh, sorry. One, uh, one other reason to study uh, the GFF, it's because in some regimes like the scaling limits uh, of the GFF, for instance, are very related to of the easy model or other statistical mechanics models. In fact, I, I will bring it later, actually not entirely sure that in the nearest neighbor's case this was done, but at least in a, a long range version I will mention later, for Bits are sufficiently small, the scaling limit of the GF of the easing model, if I look at the magnetization, is really given by the equivalent of the GFF of the long range. I'm not sure I have seen this result in the nearest neighbors, but I think it's very much expected. Right, so I can define one embedding of my uh, uh, of my stage into like as a to see this as now a, a random function or a random distribution, because I'm really here putting Dirac delta functions, and I see this as a distribution. I can test against functions and see how things happen, like how, if there is a limit as um, I set my mesh size to go to zero. And indeed, you can make sense of this. Uh, now you're going to have covariance structure, which is resembling the uh, green function again, but in the continuous. You can do this again in many different settings, manifolds, graphs, domains. Right. One thing to, to notice, though, is that in dimension one, I'm here keeping things in any dimension in principle. Uh, this is, will indeed be a random variable that it's uh, a continuous function. In fact, it will be the Brownian bridge. If, sorry, here it's because I'm, I'm doing the torus, so it's it's the Brownian bridge if I want, if I shift by the uh, spatial average. But if I was thinking of setting two boundary points to be zero, this is just the brown and bridge. But as I go to higher dimensions, the green function starts being infinite near the diagonal, so I really have to think this not as a random variable, but a random distribution. So it only makes sense once I test against a function. So to, yeah, rather than thinking of a random variable associated to each point of my domain, I have to think of a, a, random, uh, a random field or random Gaussian field, which is indexed by functions. And like for each given function, I'll have a structure, I'll have a random variable that is really real valued. Okay? Uh, yes. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have any questions. I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, one uh, other prominent Gaussian field that happens with some frequency in statistical mechanics as the scaling limits of all the objects, uh, say uniforming spanning trees, I mean small probability in general, abelian sand piles is the so-called Bilaplacian field, which is essentially the same thing as I did before by setting uh, my Hamiltonian like with a, a priori measure which is the Lebesgue measure and subtracting the, the uh, spatial mean, but now I put the Hamiltonian to be rather than a single Laplacian, it's twice the Laplacian, essentially. And now I'm going to give more weight to states in which uh, configurations in which I have uh, my bill up, which is composing the Laplacian with itself, it's close to zero. Right, and for this setting, I can actually see that it I can characterize the bill Laplacian field in another way, which is, ah, this is the solution of a differential equation, where now this right-hand side is um, the white noise, like a discrete white noise. This is really like putting one random variable, a normal random variable here, means zero variance one, like a normal distribution, and subtracting the average. So I can see this as the solution of a stochastic VT. But again, like you can have this dichotomy, you can either see from the point of view of like just a Hamiltonian, or I can see from the point of view of a PD. And those are the same things in some contexts, if you're in the full RD, or if you're in the torus. If you're in, uh, if you're in a domain, you have like the different boundary conditions, because essentially, uh, when you go to fourth all the differential operators, you have to set not one set of boundary conditions, but multiple, and depending on how you choose those, they might or not coincide. Right. But much like the previous case in the GFF, I can take scaling limits, and I can characterize the, uh, the final distribution, which is actually the solution of uh, SPDE as well. 
Here it's the white noise, which is that field that I mentioned that it's essentially giving to each point a random variable of a uh, normal random variable, which has an uh, infinite variance at each point. But you can make sense of this again by just saying, well, the GFF, if I test against a, norm, uh, against a function, this is just a random variable with a uh, normal random variable with the variance given by the L2 norm. You, again, you can't give a, uh, a sense of like what is the pointwise value of this distribution, but it is like the, the literature on Gaussian fields is very uh, generous and like there's a lot of results. Highly recommend the, uh, the book of Zwante about Hilbert uh, Gaussian fields, but you have all of this structure. So although it's a very irregular object, it is a, something that it's easy to, to deal with in general. So what we'll be doing next is to try to push this from just looking of like both for the GFF and for the Gaussian free field, rather than looking at this standard geometry that are like nearest neighbors, we'll be going through all the, um, we'll be changing the driving random walk that we're using to define those things. Because both in the GFF case and in, in the B Laplacian, I was thinking, ah, this is somehow related to a Laplacian. What happens if I take the generator of a random walk? And in the, fall, the rest of the talk is essentially split in two parts. In one of them, it's I'm thinking of those random walks to be uh, random walks in random environments with uniformly ellipticity. And in the second part, it's long range. Okay? So, right, I define my new versions of the GFF and my new version of the B Laplacian field essentially by want the GFF to be whichever is the Gaussian uh, distribution in the torus that has covariance given by my, uh, the green function of my new operator. And uh, I'm, I'm being somewhat like calling discrete fractional fields to give like a very general name. Uh, but this is essentially my generalization of the GF of the Bill Laplacian field. Notice that in principle, I'm not asking this to be Gaussian. So this whole field is not in principle Gaussian, but in the scaling limit, it tends to be under sufficiently good conditions, right? So those are my two main objects, the GFF and the Bill Laplacian. Both of them are Gaussian, ve uh, Gaussian random vectors that are somehow related to an operator. Okay. Please interrupt me if there are any questions. Right. So for the first part of this talk, uh, it's really talking about random environments. And I don't actually know if this result is known, but uh, suppose that you're working in an easy model with uh, random uh, with random J's, but like they were bounded above and below by something like a strictly ferromagnetic and I'm bounding away from zero and bounding away from infinity. You'd expect that two point correlation functions should behave not necessarily like exactly the mean of those random, but some, uh, if I'm bounding from above and below my field J, I should expect that for very large scale phenomena, this essentially behaves like a easy model, but with a J that is somewhere between the two extremities, right? I think this is very reasonable. And this is precisely the kind of result that we want to do here, okay? And it's based on the idea of stochastic homogenization that I went through in a bit. Uh, so, right. Indeed, consider the random, ver uh, random walk that it's the random walk in random environment where I have this field A N, which are IID distribute uh, IID random variables which I, I consider to be positive, bounded away from zero and bounded in, bounded away from infinity. So it's just a random variable. Think of continuous time, just so I don't have to renormalize it uh, to be equal to one. But at each point, I, I go with pro probability proportional to one of my neighbors according to what is the conductance towards that direction. Uh, and I, once I have defined this operator, I can define my B Laplacian and my GFF, right? Here is a, and I would expect that maybe up to a multiplicity factor, I have that my B Laplacian or my GFF, it's really similar to my uh, original field. Like, yeah, like I still should bring, uh, large scales, either GFF or Bill Laplacian. This is exactly what happens here in the left is a truly uh, constant 
conductance, so it's really simple random walk. This one is a uh, uh, Bill Laplace, uh, both of them sampling from the same noise. Remember that they are solving an equation that has a noise. So in this first one, I have uh, the Laplacian, it's really the Laplacian. This one, I have this random Laplacian field where the distribution are Bernoulli's that either take value one or two with probability half. Uh, you might not be able to see the values here, but they, are, uh, they have a slightly different range, but if you multiply by the right thing, the scale of the difference is much smaller. I don't know if this picture actually helps much to say, but it's, if you look at the shapes of those two, they look a lot alike. So the maximums and the minimums concentrate around the same regions. And what I proved with Violetta was precisely that this, this fractional field that we took uh, for the GF, so the generalization of the Bilaplacian field does converge, in fact, in some Sobolov topology. Uh, almost surely we can, we can couple the continuous noise and discrete noise in such a way that my discrete fields converge almost surely to this uh, continuous one up to a constant. That and a similar thing happens for the GFF, but we don't find quite the same coupling, so the convergence is just in distribution. And this constant A is one, it's actually the same one, but here it's to the power minus one, and here's to the power minus half. And this whole idea comes from uh, stochastic homogenization, which is a very old area in probability. But suppose that, say, you're trying to solve the heat equation in like a real bar, like in a real magnetic bar. It's not true that this whole thing is homogeneous, right? You would have like, I don't know, some packets here that have a capacity that is, I don't know, K1 and K2 um, and so on. Like, and like, so it turns out that if you try to solve an equation, like the heat equation, say delta T minus A X, uh, F equal to zero with some boundary condition, but I don't really want to talk too much about the boundary condition here. Uh, if I try to solve this equation where this function is varying because I'm, I'm like trying to work in a real uh, bar of magnet, this is really annoying to compute. Like it's a simple equation. We all know that uh, it, it can be solved. Like if you do a first course on PDEs, you can show the existence of the solution, but if you actually want to compute, this is bad, like uh, computationally, it takes quite a long time. But if I'm talking about the bar of magnet, yeah, you have all of those packages, but you would expect that some form of law of large numbers kicks in if there is some form of uh, averaging behavior. So you would expect that, no, forget about this. Like I don't need to do all of this. Maybe there is such a, a constant that I can just substitute by the Laplacian. Uh, and to be able to approximate, or perhaps I should have put both of them. Could you zero? And perhaps I can approximate up to a constant, I have something of the sort, oh no, uh, up to a constant, this F and F bar, if I look at scales that are sufficiently large. Perhaps if I take my domain to be in one over epsilon times u, so I'm like really getting a very large uh, area, and as like I let uh, my domain become really large, this this should go to zero in some norm, right? Perhaps I have to renormalize it as well. But the idea is that there is an averaging behavior, right? Um, and this is precisely what kicks in, and like the this. A bar is precisely that constant over there. And in order for this to happen, you need some form of, as I said, like a, a, an averaging principle, like a, a spatial averaging principle. In this, the first type of results in this area were like more, assume that this function AX is periodic, and then you will have like some averaging behavior, or then in probability measure, Oh, sorry, in probability theory, people took as if it's stochastic, but it's stationary. And then you have to assume some conditions of how well, how fast this, uh, this mix is and so on. But there is a theory for this as well. In fact, uh, oh yeah, we also have some other settings, but I don't want to go too much into this. Uh, 
so like there was in the sense of stochastic homogenization there was like this first attempt uh, back in the 80s oh yeah late 70s and 80s uh, just showing that there is a convergence that this goes to zero but there was no understanding on how fast or like how I can approximate those things uh, and this was the situation for quite a while even though like we managed to push this towards like nonlinear equations and so on um, but only more recently there were results on like a qualitative uh, setting that is I can actually say rate of convergence of this type of objects and this is important for our proof um, I'm not going to enter too much in details but you really need some quantitative estimates to be able to make a convergence happen in a topological space right uh, right uh, I, I would say that it's this qualitative theory came essentially from two different groups which use different uh, techniques the first group by Gloria Newcomen Nolan Otto uh, came more from a log Sobolev inequality type of approach whereas Armstrong Cousy and Mohan came from a, uh, some sort of uh, Poincaré multi-scale inequality kind of approach and this uh, since then this area has actually been booming like there's a lot of results here so I, I cannot possibly try to cover all of them but just to say I think the book by those three authors is actually a very good place to start in case you're interested in to this right uh, but if you're talking rather than just talking about oh stochastic homogenization of functions because here I'm saying like I, I use this example using the heat equation this is really a PDE problem and yeah like the, the results that I was mentioning before like we, we want to study uh, those Gaussian fields that are somehow related to PDEs in some setting but it's not quite the same thing and I mean you can do this either for parabolic equations but you could also do for elliptic ones the same type of principle holds uh, so just to mention results of Gaussian fields in random environments those are a bit more new so there is uh, one by uh, Svega and Zaituni which they look at the convergence of the maximum of the GFF uh, as I said the discrete GFF uh, when you take the scaling limit this converges to something that it's not a function in dimension 2 because the variance behaves like a log and so it, it uh, disappears but like the maximum at each level how you should renormalize this maximum to get a uh, tight sequence it's actually an interesting problem has a lot to do with Gaussian multiplicative chaos and some other problems of quantum field theory um, yeah so they managed to say that even in random environments under some uh, some circumstances they do have the same type of results for the maximum uh, of those suits and also uh, don't want to spend too much time on to this but the I think maybe some of you are familiar with the uh, I think so, uh, uh, with the five four models which are essentially think of an easing model but with a continuous state space so rather than having uh, only being able to achieve plus one and minus one you make it so there is a function that has a double well and therefore uh, these values concentrate on both of those minimums and this is something that you can make sense and to make sense in this con very continuous setting you do need the GFF to put as like this a priori measure and it's a very complicated problem to um, to guarantee the existence of those measures it's how that now been constructed at least for dimension up to three uh, via PDEs uh, but there are some other things about like from dimension four and above there is triviality okay I, I don't want to take too much of a tangent here but one thing that it's interesting is that here they're really taking a, an approach uh, Martin Harry and Sain, uh they are taking an approach from uh, st uh, regularity structures which if you have ever seen like they have a very uh, they need things to work into very small scales whereas I haven't really entered into this uh, the topic here but uh, stochastic homogenization really doesn't care about small scales it only cares about very large scales because you're not in principle asking that this function is continuous you you only want to ask that say is stationary and so on you might ask for convert uh, for the decay 
of correlations, but you don't, in principle, you wouldn't want to ask for those two things. But at this point, those two problems are very incompatible. So here they had to ask for the fields to have continuous, uh, like they, they do in a continuous setting, and they had to ask for this function A to be continuous up to some uh, holder estimate, I think. All right. The proofs itself, uh, putting in very simple terms, it's, we use stochastic homogenization in the right functions that in the discrete setting is just the Fourier basis, essentially. Then once we have, uh, we understand how the things that are nearly like this Fourier basis, it's something close to the Fourier basis, we can actually express green functions in terms of those functions. And once we have, because we are looking at this, uh, we're looking at linear PDEs. Once you have the green function, you can actually push those results to understanding of the whole PD. That's essentially the idea. Uh, let me just mention again. Yeah, so this say phi k n is the Fourier basis on the discrete torus, uh, and lambda k n is the eigenvalue of the original Laplacian. If I look at the functions that nearly solve this, so if, if I was really looking at the Laplacian, here I would have A bar times the Laplacian would be equal to this, right? But this is not, I, I'm, I'm not using the, Lapla, the real Laplacian here. I'm using this thing that is approximating the Laplacian, so instead I have to look at the functions that solve this problem rather than with the original Laplacian. And once you do this, you can express the green functions in a nice setting. In this discrete setting, this, this works really easily. There is not much uh, problems throughout the proof. It's more on the continuous setting. You have to use quite a heavy machinery from analysis to make sure that things become summable and so on. But that's essentially the idea. Once you understand the covariances, you can push things through. Right. So now for the second part, which is to do with uh, long range interactions. Uh, and more importantly, I think with the rest of the theme of uh, this conference. So now we want to push the same type of results, but rather than putting a, a, range, uh, a simple random walk, we want to put a random walk that has a decay that uh, it's like a power law, say, right? And I think here, as in other, pro like in statistical mechanics as well, you have uh, that there is a certain analogy between long range uh, and dimension, like reduction of dimension that shows up in quite like, you tend to think that up to a certain level, and this actually breaks down really badly for some of the uh, heuristics, looking at say the easy model in one dimension with long range feels like if you were dealing with long or with easy model nearest neighbors in two dimensions, except that when, I don't know, if you try to look at analysity and so on, but like the very first thing, like there is a phase transition for instance, right? Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, just like a very uh, simple way of putting this, I think it's nice. It's think of a torus, like a discrete torus. I suppose I, I was putting like some statistical mechanics model on top of this. But now I will modify this graph a little bit. Suppose that I choose one uh, line, like one vertical line, and I just cut all the edges that were there. And now I want to put them back, but rather than putting them back correctly, think of, I don't know, if you want to put on your shirt and you accidentally push like the first button to the next one and you, have, you only realize at the end, but then at this point you put the last one back to the top. Doesn't make sense, but uh, the idea is, from a statistical mechanics model, this graph and this graph, don't change, like shouldn't be very different, right? Like if a long range, uh, uh, large scale behavior should be essentially the same. However, this later graph is actually isomorphic to a torus of, if this was length n, this is a torus of one dimension with length n, and now I have both nearest neighbors uh, interactions, but also uh, I have um, an edge between two, uh, two vertices that are exactly dimension n from each other. So this is just to say, these, like, there is a reason why those things interact. Like you have this, th this is the idea that comes behind it. And to be able to, exp okay, that being said, to be able to state some of the theorems, I just need to very quickly talk about the so-called fractional Laplacian. 
uh, which is the long range version of the Laplacian. Like when we're looking at the Laplacian of like a, a, a distribution, if you were to like suppose that this function is continuous, forget about this, you would just, you could say that I'm in R, for instance, I'm checking from one point and from, I have like this middle point and I can define the Laplacian without using the first derivative by Uh, the fractional Laplacian, rather than averaging things, rather than averaging the value of the function just at infinitesimally close points, I'm also doing this for like very far away points. And I have this factor of alpha here. And in principle, I'm asking alpha to be strictly between zero and two, so that all of this is well defined. You have to put a principal value in this integral, but this is well uh, well defined for any uh, any function with say C2 for it. oh yeah it's there. Uh, right, and what are some properties of this bill of this fractional Laplacian? Well it's non-local in the sense that if we have two functions and they coincide in a domain, the Laplacians also will coincide in the domain. This is not true for the fractional Laplacian. It depends on the whole function, right? Second thing is that when alpha goes to zero, this really becomes the identity. If you test it, like if you look at the fractional Laplacian of a function and you send alpha to two, oh, alpha to zero, this becomes the identity. And if you send alpha to, to two, this becomes the real Laplacian. It has a very nice Fourier transform, so you can put everything in terms of Fourier space, uh, as long as you are working either on the torus or in the whole uh, uh, RD. And, <sighs> I think it, this will be better summarized by a picture that I will show in a bit, but like this alpha ha speaks somewhat about like how regular, like a, the solutions of equations will be when you look at this fractional field, like when you look at solutions of fractional Laplacian of a function equal to something. If you have like, you get some shout the regularity that is in terms of alpha say. In this continuous level, you can actually, if you compute the fractional Laplacian and then compute again, they add up as long as they are in the same region, but then if I, I know that I can extend this to alpha in any R. Right. And this is a very quick crash course on fractional Laplacians. And yeah, once again, I want to look at those few those sorry. I want to look at those fields that have to do with a uh, random walk that now has long jumps. But now, because I'm introducing this non-locality, my final equation cannot be expected to be something local. So I have to introduce these fields that are the fractional Gaussian fields. And it's essentially the same definition as before, but now with a fractional Laplacian for alpha between zero and two, yeah, for S between zero and two, for instance. Does that make sense? Again, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, right. So now if I look at this uh, random walk with a polynomial decay depending on alpha, I want to see like how do the scaling limits work the same. Uh, and yeah, essentially this should go to the fractional Laplacian. Oh yes, here are some simulations for different values of alpha. And perhaps here I think it's a good moment to, to look at this thing of regularity that I mentioned. You can see that things become way more irregular as alpha become, this is alpha equal to half. I don't know if you can see alpha equal to one alpha equals to 1.5 and alpha equals to 2. So you're kind of, the, the bigger alpha is, the more regular the, the graph is. But this is only half of the story because if you actually push alpha beyond 2, well, then I go back to my uh, random walk, this p. This is now in the domain of attraction of a, a Brownian motion, right? So this should this, this becomes a normal Laplacian again, even though in the discrete level there is this long range. Uh, so, oh. So for alpha bigger than two, you actually will recover the Bill Laplacian field again. And this is precisely what we have. For alpha equal to two, th there is, it's slightly annoying. I don't know if you ever had to work with these kind of things, but when you are in the, if you have all the, uh, if you have a random variable that has all of the moments up to order two, but uh, two minus epsilon, but you don't have, uh, the second moment is not finite, you might still be in the domain of attraction of a normal distribution, but you have to rescale by a, a log factor. So you have to be slightly more careful there, but nothing particularly uh, exciting. And here you see like this competition again between the dimension and this, fac this fractional factor. Uh, notice that, yeah, I'm putting this gamma here that it's 
the minimum is between alpha and two because once alpha is bigger than two, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, and here, just yeah. So here is set with. Uh, we could actually have done this in the previous results as well, but here I'm not looking necessarily for a noise that it's Gaussian random variables, but just any set of noise that it's IID with variance uh, in, uh, mean zero. And you have this law, for, oh, sorry, this have you, or you have like the central limit theorem going to the, uh, to the fractional field with value precisely gamma, right? Okay. Uh, we also have, as I said, like the maximums of those fields are interesting by themselves, but I don't want to spend too much time here. But once again, you can see the competition between the gamma and the dimension. Uh, and I here excluded the alpha equals to two because otherwise you have a lot of log terms, but I, I don't want to enter into this. Uh, right. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll also just quickly mention some results in this setting. So the first people to look at this Bill Laplacian fields uh, with more care, I would say, maybe not the first people. This is like this is where I started looking at them. It was in the context of sand piles, which is a model of probability that is very interesting, has to do with self-organized criticality in the sense that, I don't know, in the easy model, we have to tune the parameter beta to be exactly the critical behavior. Like, you have to tune this parameter in order to have uh, algebraic decay, for instance. There are models such as the sand pile, model that somehow self-tune to go to criticality by itself without the need of any parameters. And the bill Laplacian field has some relations to them. Uh, and so we actually were looking very much at this type of phenomena beforehand, but right. So Levine, uh, Murugan, Perez, and Ugukan, like they were looking at expectations of those bill Laplacian fields that actually came from these notions of sand piles and they, claim that this type of result, they conjecture that this kind of result would work. Uh, so they essentially prove this, this theorem for the nearest neighbor's case, and they conjecture that this would be true for the, uh, yeah, that for the nearest neighbor's case as well. Then uh, Alessandro Cipriani, Rajat, uh, Razra, and Violet Roussel, they were looking at precisely proving this theorem when you have that your noise has, uh, finite variance. They also look to the case where this noise has heavy tailed, so you're completely out of the Gaussian picture, but still with nearest neighbor interaction. Later, they also looked at, the, actually with Jan rather than Rajat, uh, if your noise that you're using to, for, to define this equation has to do, uh, it's not IID, but rather has a covariance structure. Uh, and there is this more recent result of uh, same type of results, but in terms of the spectral fractional Laplacian, which is a different way that you can define, like, there's multiple ways of defining this fractional Laplacian depending on the setting that you are, and this is a different setting kind of obtaining the same type of results that we have here. All right, uh, oh, so, sorry, oh yes, and a result that I mentioned earlier for the for long range easing model in subcritical, uh, in the subcritical setting, uh, there was this paper from last year that looks at the magnetization of this field goes in fact to the solution, like to this fractional Gaussian field. And they also hand to something that I will mention in the following, uh, which is you actually, you, you also see the next, like what comes at, uh, at smaller scales, what is the next thing? You have firstly this fractional Gaussian field, and after that they have a white noise, say. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is in fact what I want to do now to finish. It's kind of right. We know that uh, this field converges to this one in, uh, I just said it was like a CLT, but maybe I can couple the two fields so they are in the same like I can couple them well so that I have this convergence in probability. Could I possibly multiply this by something to have a non-trivial result, like a non-trivial field? What, what would this look like? What kind of field would come after this? Does the question make sense? It's like, yeah, yeah, sorry. So if I have my field here, the 
depending on P, and I know that this is converging like maybe to a constant times fractional Laplacian. I want to multiply this perhaps by, I don't know, n to some power, and obtain something that it's uh, non-trivial, like it's different than zero. Like what is the right scale to look at this? This is kind of like a Taylor expansion of like those distributions, what this looks like. Uh, and yeah, it turns out that this is, this is possible to do. This is not something that you would be able to do with like any random variable, say, like you can't get a, once you have a sequence of Bernoulli's converting to a Gaussian and you try, can try to couple the two and then like do this, this is not, like you, what you find is another Gaussian probably. Uh, but in this setting, it turns out that we can find this type of fields. Uh, and it's important to say that this will depend on the random walk that is underneath. The idea is, if you are approximating some form of continuous object, say like you're approximating the scaling limit of the Ising model in critical dimension or, or like in the critical beta, or you're looking at any other type of result like this, you don't expect that this is going to depend on the exact lattice that you're using. You don't expect that this is going to depend if you're using nearest neighbor or in fact, uh, neighbors of up to one and two, like you, you don't expect this kind of things to really affect your limit. But it will affect what, what is the error essentially. So what is what is this error looks like around this fractional field? Uh, and it turns out that it depends in, uh, of, in terms of this fractional uh, cumulants, which is what we call them. So when you are dealing with random walks, uh, like if you want to approximate the Brownian motion and you want to choose a random walk to approximate the Brownian motion. If you are going to do this in class, like the first, like you're going to take the simple random walk because it's the easiest thing to show, like it's the most natural candidate, right? And perhaps when you're looking at uh, something with long range uh, interactions, your instinct is, well, the best approximation of a stable distribution, like a, a, a Levy process with parameter alpha, which is the equivalent of the Brownian motion once you introduce, uh, which is related to fractional Laplacian rather than the regional Laplacian. You might think, oh yeah, I should take something that it's essentially this guy. Uh, I should take the, uh, the interactions, maybe like if you're looking at easing models as well and you want something that it's non-local and you have like heavy tails, maybe you think, oh, this is the best thing that I can do. Like this is the most natural one. And it turns out that it's like for in a sense, it's not necessarily the best approximation. In fact, if you, uh, you could think of like, if I try to approximate, like if you ask a physicist what a Gaussian uh, random variable is, they might say stay in terms of cumulants. Cumulants are essentially the log of the characteristic function and the expansion of this log term. For the random, uh, for normal random variables you have, that there is no cumulants above order two, right? There is only the mean and the variance, and like it's actually exponential of mu times i theta minus variance squared divided by two. And then you don't have anything else. So if I'm trying to approximate a random variable, uh, a normal random variable, I could use as a measure of estimate like how many cumulants there are, like how can I, can I measure the, between the distance of the, like the size of those cumulants? And I could do this in a similar setting here for this fractional, uh, sorry, for this long range random walks. Uh, right, the thing is, also if you go to show some results about uh, convergence of green functions of discrete to continuous uh, random walks and you get a quantitative bound, the standard thing is, oh, I will ask for four finite moments rather than like, uh, I, I want to do like a general setting rather than just say simple random walk if I want to have like good control. But what this really does is that you can expand the characteristic function up to order four, right? Uh, if I have four finite moments, then I have expansion up to the four and I can do error. But once you do this for, uh, for random walks, which will not have second finite moment, you cannot do this directly. You cannot, uh, you cannot say, oh, we have all the four moments. So what we do is that we go straight to the characteristic function and we ask for this characteristic function to obey a certain expression, uh, a certain expansion. All of this to say is like, depending on the random walk that you choose, 
maybe you won't have any further parameter, like you won't have any further expressions here. This would be like the equivalent of having no further cumulants. Or it could be that I have many. Like, and like the, the idea is that the your approximation is the best to bigger this gap between those two is, those two are. Right? And it turns out that if you choose uh, the polynomial decay, this beta is always going to be equal to two. Like this is a, a very, very long but doable computation uh, that we did with Violet and Newton. Uh, so for when alpha is close to two, but not two, this gap becomes really small and this approximation becomes bad in some sense. So it turns out that you, with like a bit of a trickery, you can remove this essentially by making some operation like changing uh, the law of your random walk slightly and suddenly you, you're free of this guy and you have a bigger gap between this and the next uh, values. And once you do that, like this, uh, this uh, beta being between alpha uh, and alpha plus one, here is strictly technical, it doesn't really matter, it's just for the way that I embedded uh, this field into RD. But, so what we have is that now if I and I know exactly the characteristic function, uh, which obeys like the previous uh, paragraph. Now I have that if I uh, multiply exactly by n to the beta minus alpha, so in terms of this gap, I have a new field here, which is also a fractional Gaussian field. And in this case, it's actually quite simple. It's just another fractional Gaussian field, which has to do with, it's essentially the fractional Laplacian of the previous field. Ah, and by the way, th this thing is not independent of this one. In fact, they are sampled from the same white noise, so they are actually very related. Um, right. Uh, but so the thing is, the more, the bigger is the gap, the smaller is going to be this window in which we see the error. However, whatever I have here, it's going to be actually less regular, right? Because as beta becomes really large, this actually becomes more irregular. And that's the idea. And we could actually iterate this process, essentially bring it to a kind of a Taylor expansion of, uh, so I, I see something discrete and I put as a, a very large expression of like sum of continuous uh, distributions. And so I can approximate those things. Uh, and where we are at now, so like for next questions, it's kind of trying to push this beyond the case of linear equations. In fact, I, uh, we have results for the parabolic case. I didn't really enter into this, but this is essentially, suppose that we are putting the uh, Glauber dynamics in this uh, like fractional fields, rather than just looking at the stationary distribution. And there, the second order field is actually more complicated. It's not something so trivial. So you need to be more careful, which will become a problem when you're looking at nonlinear equations. And why would we want to look at nonlinear equations? Well, if I wanted to look at pi for three, or if I wanted to look at um, polymers, uh, like disordered polymers, where I put the Hamiltonian being how, like where the point, uh, the sum of the weights of like the different points that the polymer touches. This is very related both to statistical mechanics and to stochastic PDs. Right, so the things, yeah, so just to bring everything together, what we're looking at today was, uh, I have generalization of the FF and the Bilaplacian, looking at these different geometries of different uh, diffusions that are guiding this process. And for the first part, we're looking more at like this random uh, walks in random environments. In the second part, it was more about these random uh, walks with very long jumps. So one thing that we would like to do, for instance, in the case of the stochastic uh, homogenization is to go say, I have asked to be in the setting of uh, uniformly elliptic. So I'm, I'm bounding my values A to be away from zero, but I could do the same kind of result in the critical, uh, like a supercritical Bernoulli cluster, right? And can I do the same thing? Things get messier there, but I think, like, we think that we can push the results. And also, can we do both things at once? But this is a bit of science fiction, to be honest, at least for right now. Uh, 
whereas for like the second order fields, like this, like this further expansions of the fields, we're currently, yeah, uh, we, we would like to do this for already for random environments as well, because I could have done the same thing there that I just described, where where I know that this thing converges to this thing, can I multiply by something here and get like a non-trivial result? And we believe that this is possible. There is actually, it would be related to something called the correctness of the stochastic homogenization, but I don't have time to go over this. Uh, we could, al we also would like to do some other non-linear uh, transformations. So GMC Gaussian multiplicative chaos is to do with what happens if you exponentiate the Gaussian free field, for instance, in dimension two. Now this thing, if you randomize it, this g converges to a certain object that is very prominent in physics, this day, in mathematical physics these days, has lots to do with uh, Liouville quantum gravity and other interesting objects. And yeah, we would like to understand what, what the sec, like if we're ma essentially making a Taylor expansion for this guy, and I'm constructing some object from this guy, what, what does this imply there? Like how does this change the fields? Uh, and yeah, as I said, try to push this also to nonlinear PDs to, to be able to expand this to all the interesting models. Yeah, and I believe that's it. Thank you very much. So, any question or comment? Okay. If you, uh, for example, in your situation, you have a kind of a general setting, right? Mm -hmm. In which you have r to the power r. So, yes, yes. So if you make it maybe a bit more easier, so think you take a graph and the single sides are, for example, compact spaces, or think about a sphere or something. Could it? How would your analysis be simplified? I think. The, uh, so I think the problem is still st like an infinite product measure. We, o we only define very good like infinite product measures in general spaces when we have a probability measure. You can still circumvent this, kind I of. I would, yeah, you wouldn't take the Gaussian then, right? Because if you have, if you, I oh, I see. Take, take the measure associated to the Liouville volume form of your sphere, how to say, or for your, I don't know about what you consider. Mm, I see. Uh, then maybe something would change, but. Oh, okay. If you really, t the thing is, because we're going to test against functions, at the end, because at, at we're always looking at things that are very regular here. So even if you test against functions and you just see the variations, I can, for instance, if I to define uh, for the easy, uh, if I look at the magnetization field, which is just for like the easy model, which is going to be something like this, right? And I'm going to uh, say this sum over some graph gn that I'm taking as the discretization of a, a continuous gra uh, domain and I multiply by some factor that I, I don't know by the top of my head. This often, as I said, like this still converges to something that essentially resembles a Gaussian field. So it's a after you're testing against functions because you're, test uh, you're seeing all of those fluctuations and I'm multiplying by things that are really big here, it's it's almost like you're getting the full support. Maybe if you were saying, oh no, these are always going to be positive, maybe I wouldn't have the full support, but just half of the line, and I think you can do things on this setting as well. But because of this multiplication factor, essentially you, you're not going to stay in a bounded space regardless. Yeah, yeah I see. Yeah, yeah interesting. Uh, okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? So you mentioned uh, correctness at the end. And sometimes in homogenization theory, you have to solve the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any kind of equation of this form. So do you have this kind of equation in your problem? Yes. Uh, so I, I, if you look at the, the book that I mentioned here, you it's very much about solving this type of equation, especially when I think you go to the parabolic case, you really have to do this. So I'm, I, I, I was just, I'm skipping over this. It's a set, especially when you look at the continuous setting, like in the discrete one, you can kind of go around it, but in the, this, in the continuous setting, there, this is 
here and it's a big pot, if that makes sense. Uh, in order to make those, yes, in order to make sense of these kind of things and to make the, uh, the try to improve which topology they are approximating, you end up going over uh, Hamilton Jacobian equation. I think also these corrector things that I just mentioned, you have to, to do this kind of uh, analysis as well. So I think it's a very big part of stochastic homogenization indeed, especially even in quantitative work. Yeah. So, sorry? Any other questions or comments? No. So let's thank Leandro again. <laughs> So we come back uh, at 3, 3, 3 p.m. And uh, we have a restaurant at the uh, Physics Depart uh, Institute and also in the um, management and uh, economics. It's a good restaurant we, we can choose, essentially.